Hello, hello. I don't want to blast you out, sorry. Uh, thank you for inviting me to share my ideas tonight. I will share with you a journey of mine through experience and thought that's given me a more enlightened view of the world. It all started on a day when I met a most unlikely teacher, one who helped me learn to open my mind. It was my senior year in college, and I was visiting a pet store where they sold rats for sale as pets. My first reaction to seeing the rat was, ick, look at those claw-like feet, look at that freaky tail. Uh, I took a photograph of her, she looked like this. Oh, that's how I saw her at first, at least. As I wandered away from the cage, I wondered why I had this reaction. After all, hamsters look similar, and we find them adorable. I wondered how much of my reaction was ingrained by culture. I didn't like this unfair bias I held, so I decided right then and there to adopt a rat. It didn't take me long to learn that caring for a rat wasn't like caring for a hamster. Physically and mentally, rats are much more capable problem solvers. I named her Flick due to the use of her tail because she would flick it around to instantly correct her balance. At first, she would spend most of her time in a big cage with getting time to wander around my, my apartment bedroom supervised. But I was immediately impressed by how as long as she was able to get back to her cage, she would only go to the bathroom there. She was naturally potty trained. So I ended up giving her the respect of not closing the door to her cage. She had free reign of my apartment bedroom once I made it safe for her and for my stuff. I see your faces. I know this sounds really strange to a lot of you. But I was letting my experience teach me what was best, not preconceived notions. My girlfriend, who would later become my incredible wife, thought this was a little strange at first. But then she fell in love with Flick, and she even adopted a rat also as a rescue. Her name was Digit. So Flick had a friend. Here are the three we would eventually have. When I later graduated college, Flick had free reign of my entire uh, small apartment. I started taking her everywhere with me. She would travel in my shirt sleeve, or she would ride on my shoulder. She was cute, friendly, and confident. It would always stifle anyone's initial adverse reactions to seeing her in public. I couldn't believe how wrong my first impressions were when I saw her in that pet store. Uh, people always ask me how my cat, Tiger, got along with her. Uh, I'll never forget the first time they met. I was nervous about it, obviously. I had uh, my cat, Tiger, and Flick on opposite sides of my bed, and Tiger began approaching slowly. The Flick just turned and charged, full throttle, mouth wide open at my cat. Tiger didn't know what to do. He backed up so fast. He fell off the bed and ran away. And from then on, I had never had any worries. And they even became friends, or at least they, they accepted one another. My relationship with Flick forced me to fully confront that she seemed to feel the same emotions, the joys, the pains that I do. Non-human animals don't display the same facial expressions that humans. They don't speak our language to convey their, their thoughts and words, but they have similar emotional responses. How many of you know that rats laugh when they're tickled? Flick would get noticeably joyed when she'd see me opening a granola bar because she knew I always shared. She would go up and down in her haunches and act excitedly. She'd run over and try to lick my hands. Most pet rats are descendants of lab rats who are bred to be easily susceptible to disease. Flick had two tumors in her short two and a half years of life before finally succumbing to pneumonia. An amazing veterinarian successfully removed both of her tumors inexpensively before they got too invasive, but nothing could stop her pneumonia. Throughout her sickness, I would watch Flick become lethargic, stop sleeping as much, not eat as much, not clean as much. Flick seemed depressed. Now, people used to think calling animals like Flick depressed was anthropomorphic, where one attributes human characteristics to non-human animals. But the parts of Flick's brain that we understand cause emotions are practically the same as mine, just different sizes, actually larger in proportion to the whole. This is what her tumor looked like. How do we know brains work like we do? 
largely by studying the brains and behaviors of non-human animals, millions of them rats. Scientifically speaking, we have basically the same evidence that Flick experienced happiness, anxiety, depression, pain, love, affection, comfort, euphoria, and suffering as we have that you and I do. She felt, and she felt deeply, and when she suffered, she suffered deeply. My point in telling you all about my old rat flick is not to get everyone to brush out and adopt pet rats. It's to show how we need to question these biases that we have, to show that they're founded in reality. We can do a better job of questioning doing good and doing harm to animals. We are moved to reduce suffering in humans because we recognize in other spaces, we understand through empathy what it's like. Our understanding forces us to be compassionate to other human beings. Why do we bypass what we now know about non-human animal suffering in so many of our behaviors. If we humans are supposedly superior in our ability to rise above our merely instinctual responses and instead behave with a higher logic and a reason, we should be doing it in smarter and much more effective ways. This brings me to a contradictory reasoning process that many of us allow ourselves to be entrenched within. I call it the animal exploitation paradox. The excuses we make for causing non-human animal suffering is that these other animals don't have the same capacity for suffering as we do, that their suffering is less significant, less profound. But during this exact exploitation process, we've long proven scientifically that these animals do have our same capacity for suffering, that it is significant and it is profound. So since this excuse is invalid, why do we still tolerate the rampant animal exploitation, especially in experimentation, entertainment, and factory farming? I ask us to reconsider how we think of intelligence. What we humans call intelligent behaviors are often behaviors that we humans find advantageous in our lives. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to measure other species' intelligence in the same way as a sort of comparison to ours. Other animals don't have the same need for some of our abilities, just like we don't have the same need for some of theirs. For example, consider the intelligence it would take to find your way through a tunnel with countless pathways in the pitch dark. Well, Flick could do that, and she would watch most of us trying that and think we're idiots. When I would come home from work to my apartment and not know where my little rat leaves were, I wouldn't just call to them because the space was so large. I would also gently tap on the floor. They would use their extraordinary echolocation skills and their unparalleled memory for pathways to find the way to me in no time. Really, this is mostly for fun. I usually had a pretty good idea where they were. They were usually snuggled up together in my sock drawer. <laughs> but none of us could do this feat as well. Humans could best be described as mentally deficient at this skill. Or how about our sense of smell? Smells tell entire stories to rats and other animals. They don't need, they can smell the ingredients and in potential food. They don't need the side box labels like we do. They can tell who has been where and when. They can tell many, many things. And I'm just talking about skills that we've proven in laboratory experiments. Skills with humans could only be described as mentally deficient when attempting. So what if we started focusing on what we have in common with other species, neurologically speaking, instead of how we outshine them using our own measuring tools? For example, all animals are hardwired to reduce their own suffering. Many animals, both human and not human, even attempt to reduce the suffering of others. The word humane is spelled as if, and often thought of it as if, only applying to humans, but endless observations and clever experiments have shown other species behaving humanely, which is showing compassion. In a recent experiment, researchers showed that rats will help free another trapped rat for no, relief, for no uh, reward other than relieving that rat's distress. In an alteration to that design, rats would help free a trapped rat before going after a stash of chocolate chips being offered. The rats would go after the other rat and help free him before going after the chocolate over half of the time. 
I don't know about you, but I have trouble sharing chocolate with anyone in any circumstance, and people who know me can attest to that. In a cruel experiment in 1958, hungry rats were only fed when they would pull a lever to electrically shock another rat, and at the expense of their own hunger, they would refuse to pull the lever. You may have heard of the really famous human experiment known as the Milgram experiment from 1963. It was an experiment to show people's blind obedience to authority. Volunteers were told to press a button to electrically shock someone else when that person answered questions wrong. The volunteers would continue to press the button despite pleading and begging from the people getting shocked, just because they were told to keep pressing that button. Now, in reality, the person who seemed to get shocked was actually another researcher pretending to get shocked, but the volunteers, they didn't know this. Now, these experiments I'm talking about are completely analogous, but they do force me to rethink there being any ethical hierarchy in the animal kingdom where we place human beings at the pinnacle. I, to, I also have to point out that whereas we made sure the human in the experiment wasn't actually suffering, no similar, no similar attempt was made in the case of that rat suffering. After my talk, I hope you will think of ways you can reduce suffering. I've changed a lot of what I do and what I buy over time as I've become more educated, and I know I'll continue to change and think about what I'm willing to give up or change in order to reduce, reduce needless suffering. However, I'll never forget the night when I realized what I had to do with my life, with what I learned from my rat flick. I was out to eat one night at a chain restaurant with my future wife and her parents at a typical chain restaurant it was, and I remember staring at the filet mignon that I was about to order. And I couldn't do it anymore. I was now fully aware of the life I was paying someone else to force on an animal with emotions, and pain, and sentience, like flicks, like mine, in factory farming. Even then, I, I had no delusion that this cow I was about to eat had grown up in an actual farm like you'll see if you're driving around. I have learned that about 99% of animals raised for food in the US grow up behind closed doors that corporations spent countless efforts trying to stop us from seeing behind. We call them factory farms, because they, they know we wouldn't stand for it. It wasn't for my health, which should have been enough. It wasn't for the environment, which we know should be enough. It was so that I wouldn't feel responsible for causing suffering for something I didn't need. In my opinion, and I've learned I'm not alone on this, factory farming causes more suffering than any other human endeavor in the world. This may sound extreme, but let's consider it mathematically. Just in our country alone, over nine billion Infant land animals are torn away from their mothers, forced into CAFOs, and then slaughtered every single year. It's over 9 billion every year just in our country. It's hard to imagine anything else that causes more suffering than that. Remember, there are only about 7 billion humans on our entire planet today at any one time. I couldn't handle the thought of being responsible for over 2,000 land animals, which I learned is how many animals are raised and slaughtered, almost all in factory farms, for the life of an average American. So by far the most humane and ethical thing I figured I could do with my life was boycott this type of, animal, this type of um, food. Thankfully, I'm not the only one reaching this conclusion. Recently, there's been a surge of Americans reducing their land animal-based food consumption. Here's the estimated meat and poultry consumption per U.S. American each year. The U.S. meat industry has been raising about 12% less animal meat per capita since 2007. Now, 12% might not seem like that much, but this amounted to hundreds of millions of land animals not having to live a life of suffering in factory farming. It's hard to imagine anything else that can reduce more suffering than that. Our economic system, remember this, 
Our economic system is built on supply and demand. So standing up for what you believe in is not only a very American way of boycotting, but it's also a really effective way to change business practices. Remember, my parents always taught me that spending money, every dollar, is like a vote that says, yes, keep doing this because I support you. So if you don't have a lot of money to donate to charities and other places that do good, remember, deciding not to spend money where you otherwise would have can be just as or even more charitable. In summary, physically, we look and behave very differently from other animals. Physical pain, though, is primarily the same. Mentally, we have a lot of the same, a lot of different strengths, but who are we to say which ones are better? Emotionally, we're extremely, we're extremely similar. We can all suffer, and we're all aware of our own suffering. Let us stop viewing ourselves as humans and other animals as animals. We're all animals. Let's focus on what we have in common. Think of ways you're willing to reduce the suffering by waking up your own mind. We are the only ones who can make that difference. We have all the power. We have all the knowledge. So that gives us the responsibility. Let's stop viewing ourselves as the rulers of all species and instead see ourselves as the caretakers. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to my journey. Thank you.